Welcome to the Sense Making in a Changing World podcast, where we explore the kind of thinking we need to navigate a positive way forward. I'm your host, Maura Gamble, permaculture educator and global ambassador, filmmaker, eco villager, food forester, mother, practivist, and all round lover of thinking, communicating, and acting regeneratively. For a long time, it's been clear to me that to shift trajectory to a thriving one planet way of life, we first need to shift our thinking. The way we perceive ourselves in relation to nature, self and community is the core. So this is true now more than ever. And even the way change is changing is changing. Unprecedented changes are happening all around us at a rapid pace. So how do we make sense of this? To know which way to turn, to know what action to focus on, so our efforts are worthwhile and nourishing and are working towards resilience, regeneration and reconnection. What better way to make sense than to join together with others in open, generative conversation? In this podcast, I'll share conversations with my friends and colleagues, people who inspire and challenge me in their ways of thinking, connecting and acting. These wonderful people are thinkers, doers, activists, scholars, writers, leaders, farmers, educators, people whose work informs permaculture and spark the imagination of of what a post-COVID, climate resilient, socially just future could look like. Their ideas and projects help us to make sense in this changing world, to compost and digest the ideas and to nurture the fertile ground for new ideas, connections and actions. Together we'll open up conversations in the world of permaculture design, regenerative thinking, community action, earth repair, eco-literacy and much more. I can't wait to share these conversations with you. Over the last three decades of personally making sense of the multiple crises we face, I always return to the practical and positive world of permaculture with its ethics of earth care, people care and fair share. I've seen firsthand how adaptable and responsive it can be in all contexts, from urban to rural, from refugee camps to suburbs. It helps people make sense of what's happening around them and to learn accessible design tools to shape their habitat positively and to contribute to cultural and ecological regeneration. This is why I've created the Permaculture Educators Program to help thousands of people to become permaculture teachers everywhere through an interactive online dual certificate of permaculture design and teaching. We sponsor global perma youth programs, women's self-help groups in the global south and teens in refugee camps. So anyway, this podcast is sponsored by the Permaculture Education Institute and our Permaculture Educators Program. If you'd like to find more about permaculture, I've created a four-part permaculture video series to explain what permaculture is and and also how you can make it your livelihood as well as your way of life. We'd love to invite you to join our wonderfully inspiring, friendly and supportive global learning community. So I welcome you to share each of these conversations and I'd also like to suggest you create a local conversation circle to explore the ideas shared in each show and discuss together how this makes sense in your local community and environment. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I meet and speak with you today, the Gubby Gubby people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So I'd like to welcome Emma Kate Rose to the show. Emma Kate is someone who I have long admired and been inspired by. I'm just going to read some of these things (laughs) um, because it's too many to stick in my my mind, all the things we do. I mean, apart from being a most amazing mother and climate activist and and speaker and and social advocate, Emma Kate is also, she leads Food Connect. Um, And I'll let you maybe tell us a bit more about Food Connect soon because that's an amazing part of this whole concept about changing our food system and thinking differently about the future of food and and resilience in community and economy. Um, Emma Kate is also the executive director of the Food Connect Foundation and is the chair of the Queensland Social Enterprise Council, um, project manager with the Next Economy, all about transitioning (laughs) communities um, from a, into like into a post fossil fuel economy, really, I think is where you're going with that. I know I've missed something. Oh, also a fellow of the Eunice Centre for Social Business at Griffith University. And something else that's really remarkable um, that I think has just opened up a a huge new conversation is what you did recently with equity crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you're not only doing food differently, uh, you're doing business completely differently. And I Mm -hmm. think what this... 
why I really wanted to to have this conversation, apart from the fact that I love talking with you, every time I talk with you, I feel so uplifted. <laughs> but there's so much about what you do and how you do it that I think is what we need to hear right now. Like as as we're you know right now as we're speaking, we're in in the COVID nineteen lockdown, and and there's some really uh, important lessons that you've experienced over the last 14 years in Food Connect that can help um, in the in the recovery, thinking differently about how we move forward from this point. Um, but beyond COVID, it's also, I think, a really important thing to think about as we're recovering, well, not as we're recovering, as we address climate change. You know, the type of business that you're doing is more resilient and adaptable and flexible and caring and um, supporting local enterprise and local farmers. So um, maybe we could just start at the beginning possibly. Of, just tell us a little bit about what Food Connect is about because I think this as a foundation of what you do is just an extraordinary project. Yeah, oh, thank you so much, Morag. It's really lovely to, to be um, on this interview. I feel very honoured to be asked actually, because I've been also a long admirer of your work <laughs> and um, actually have convinced my daughter to start participating in some of, some of your programs for youth. And she was devastated the other day when she missed the five o'clock call. So I said, well, you can join in next week. Actually, you know what, there's going to be um, 50, 50 uh, people from a refugee camp in oh. Kenya are waiting to join in too. So I'll make oh, sure wow. she gets a link for that. because yeah. yeah, Yeah, she'd love that. Mm. Um, yeah, so, you know, kudos to you as well. I think, you know, in your own way, you, you're making huge um, changes in the world and the ripple effects of, of what you do can be felt um, way beyond your, um, you know, beautiful location at Crystal Waters. Um, yeah, so Food Connect, um, uh, for those who don't know, um, a lot of people in Brisbane, South East Queensland have heard of Food Connect, um, but I suppose there are areas of the areas that haven't and um, it was started by my partner Rob Peakin who was an ex-dairy farmer. Um, he lost his farm um, back in the late 90s due to drought and um, overbearing banks and ended up losing his fourth generation farm and through that process had an epiphany that actually he didn't even know the people who drank his milk. Like he was, he, he was part of an industrialised food system that was so disconnected um, from, you know, between the grower and the consumer or the eater, as we like to call people, um, that he just thought there's got to be a better way. And so um, he came across the concept of community-supported agriculture, which um, actually and recently I just found out was always known to originate from versions of it from Japan and Switzerland, but it was actually started in the 60s by black farmers in Alabama, wow. um, yeah, as a as a mutual, um, you know, uh, way for eaters and growers to support each other, um, particularly through um, hard times. So, um, so community supported agriculture is basically a concept where a whole bunch of community members pay up front a subscription for a season's worth of of healthy fruit and veg. Um, with, a, with a focus on organic um, and natural farming methods and regenerative farming methods. Um, and it sort of taken off as a concept. And it was always traditionally just one farmer and a bunch of community. Um, and when Rob um, trialled that system for a number of years, he landed in Brisbane and he realised that actually it wasn't really that relevant for Brisbane because we've all got access to anything we want whenever we want here. Um, so how can we build a local food system that has the principles of community supported agriculture as the foundation, but just operationally includes a lot more than just one farmer um, and a lot more eaters. Um, so we now have um, been going for 14, 15 years um, as a bit of an experiment and we're still here, um, but we always knew that we didn't want to be a not-for-profit or a charity model of food enterprise. We really wanted it to be a business and for it to stand on its own two feet economically because we knew that that would be the most resilient way of, of hanging around for the long term, um, being able to engage um, now 80 farmers and 40-odd food makers um, who are all locally sourced. So we sort of drew a circle around Brisbane of no more than sort of, you know, um, 400 k's um, depending on what season it is so we're very lucky here in southeast Queensland we have lots of microclimates um, we've got the beautiful stone fruit growing areas up at Stanthorpe we've got 
um, you know, amazing <clears throat> Mediterranean veggies um, coming up from Gympie and Bundaberg and the Mary Valley. And we've got some, you know, all the lovely, um, you know, fresh greens and whatever much closer to the city. Um, and so, um, so we've been able to operate a local food system now for that long and we've withstood the GFC, we've withstood the Brisbane 2011 floods, um, which we actually thought the local food system would fail during that time because all of South East Queensland was affected by those floods. But because of the small nature of our farm, of our farmers, um, their operations, um, didn't require big, you know, infrastructure or massive machinery to harvest. They could get out into their fields really quickly. They, they knew the back roads, um, when the highways were cut off so that they could get the produce to us. And I think throughout that whole period of the floods, we only lost one day of productivity. And then at the same time managed to kind of galvanize the community to go and feed the um, mud army while they were cleaning up Brisbane as well. So I also I remember something about that time too when um, Rob, I remember Rob talking about how, you know, we were a few days away in Brisbane from actually running out of food in mm. the industrial food system. However, yeah. in the local food system, it really highlighted the resilience that is, that is there when yeah. we embrace a local food system. And I have a sense too that you're feeling that now that yes. there's a much greater resilience in, in this local food system. And maybe you could talk a little bit about how Food yeah. Connect's responding right now because it's yeah. quite an extraordinary time. Yeah, interesting. Um, so it's, it's funny because we've been able to prove the model um, through these crisis points. And, um, and then it's funny, people are, people are weird. Um, they drop off, they go away, they enter back into the business as usual food system and we just hold our he heads above water, you know, almost waiting for the next crisis. <laughs> but we always knew that, you know, we would be ready for and that we designed a system um, not just by community-supported agriculture principles but also by permaculture principles where, you know, that there was enough diversity um, in our group of farmers um, where if there was a crisis in one geographical area, we could rely on another in our local area. Um, that if, you know, um, someone had issues with growing something that another farmer could help them out. You know, we tried to encourage as much mutual cooperation as possible amongst our suppliers, particularly in an industry that's traditionally, you know, very competitive and they often don't share information. But, um, yeah, the, the COVID pandemic has really brought a new light um, into the situation where we haven't really had a climate crisis, although you could argue that, that COVID is a climate crisis yeah. in terms of it, its macro um, context. But um, with our local food supply, what we've seen is that um, when we had food disappearing off the shelves of supermarkets, um, that, you know, our sales quadrupled and we were able to meet the supply without any issues at all. In fact, like looking back now with, with a month sort of, of lockdown in hindsight, we were actually underperforming before. So we had enough fat in the system to be able to meet the challenge and, um, and rise to the occasion um, and had to employ more staff. And we employed those staff basically from community. So there are enough people around the Food Connect Shed here in Brisbane who knew us, who were sacked pretty much straight away as soon as lockdown came in, came knocking on the door and said, I've got a van, I can help with deliveries, um, you know, sign me up. Yeah, <laughs> so it's all those sort of that what we call social capital that really kicks in in times of crisis. Mm. And um, that's what we've found in terms of um, not just our food supply, but also um, the way we operate the business and, and being collectively. You know, this, so beyond the Food Connect model of the linking between farmers, the, like mm. the how you do the bigger picture as well that I think is, is fantastic, you know, like um, your, your model, you offered as, as open source. If other mm. people wanted to to do this as as well, that you went out and paid it forward to help other people set up systems, and so so that itself is a is a, a mind shift in how you yeah. operate business. Yeah. And then <laughs> and then the other one too about you know your your ownership model. So the way that you bought the building mm -hmm. that you're in, and that's a completely 
different model in itself yeah. of, of how you how you own or or yeah. collectively share own this space that you're in could you maybe talk that's two big questions there but maybe pick them out your life. <laughs> because i think it's a it's a really it's the context makes what you're doing even more incredibly amazing mm. you know like it's like this little nested system that, mm. that it's so many different models that you are like you say you're experimenting with Mm. and finding that actually really work and help to create that that resilience that can that can keep things more stable like mm. um, security isn't having a massive great wealth or massive insurance security is like you just said the the, the community capital the mm. social capital and um so much more to it and i think it's a fascinating ex you know you're calling it an experiment but it, <laughs> you know it is actually a thing too it's not it just is <laughs> Yes, it's a way of life. <laughs> very real. It's very real. Um, yeah, look, I'll um, talk a little bit about the open source stuff. So we always knew, you know, we don't own this information. We've borrowed all these ideas from things that resonate with us um, and the reading that we do and the people that we've met and spoken to all over the world. Um, and um, And so we just... We just designed in what we really liked, you know, what the sort of future that we wanted to see. And so um, not all of it worked, of course, like some of it failed terribly. Um, and but one of the, the things that we're, I guess, most proud of is that initially when Food Connect was started, there was no software around to really meet the business rules in terms of um, the amount of farmers that were supplying us and the um, the way we deliver our and engage our customers in terms of, you know, having an online subscription, a regular, you know, a regular payment. Um, you could choose from like a six weeks, six months, three months, you know, a whole, you could even subscribe for a whole year upfront with your food, which was kind of nifty in terms of our cash flow, um, but also helps families budget um, with their food budget as well. So if you've got that locked in, you don't have to, to worry about it for the rest of the year. Um, and so um, so we had to find, so one of our customers, long story short, designed some software for us that we used for quite a number of years. And as groups from around Australia came and visited Food Connect to find out how we did things, um, we also gave them the software to take with them because we knew that it wouldn't work if they had to build something themselves. You know, as we all know, software is incredibly expensive to develop. Um, so that eventually transformed into a... Um, uh, uh, a not-for-profit we ended up giving it away because we had to make a decision as a business did we want to become a software company or did we want to become stay as just food connect and be with our community and just share the ideas um, and the second thing appealed to us the most so um, so we gave the software away um, to a not-for-profit called the open food network um, and that not-for-profit has now spread globally and I was just on the phone to Kirsten Larson last week. She's based in Victoria and she leads the organisation with her partner, Serenity Hill. And um, they used to get around 10 inquiries a month um, for new from farmers and um, food hubs um, to use the software. And they're now getting 10 a day. Um, so, so I was going to ask you, what, yeah, yeah. What, what shift are you seeing globally, or like around Australia or even globally? as a result of what's happening like are you seeing yeah like that's yeah, one indicator seeing, yeah we're seeing a lot of um small communities um going okay um how can we do our food better in this mm -hmm. circumstance and a lot of farmers you know they've lost markets in this pandemic the the whole tourism and hospitality sectors have literally shut down so they've had to find alternative markets as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so they have turned to Open Food Network in order to sell direct to their local community mm -hmm. um, and, you know, start developing those skills of, of you know, um, marketing and talking to customers and um, engaging with community. So that's been, that's been quite amazing. Um, and, yeah, it's, uh, it's something that we're very excited by because what it does is... Um, the software allows the farmer to transparently engage with their eater um, every step along the value and supply chain. Um, so, you know, the customers know exactly what they're paying for. The, the food system is basically democratised. Mm -hmm. um, it's all trans made transparent. Mm -hmm. um, when it 
traditionally has relied on being very, you know, opaque and mysterious in terms mm-hmm. of how the food gets from the farmer, you know, to the supermarket shelf. Um, Just on that, on this system, uh, are you finding much support from, I guess, government or other organisations <laughs> to support? You know, uh, and your 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 laugh kind of answers that question <laughs> because you know if we're looking at you know the recovery mm. and we're seeing what you're saying you know the impact for farmers impact for community mm. impact for um, local businesses and that it makes sense that mm. any restrictions that there are that kind of make it difficult for this level of the food system to happen uh, need to be lifted and that there actually be shifting subsidies from industrial farming to these localized farming systems and and are you seeing any shift in that yet or is there you know what voice are you hearing actually helping to promote that as something that could happen or is is it not something that you want would you rather (laughs) just be an underground mycelium network of independent (laughs) non non uh (laughs) non-controlled Yeah, well, there's always a danger, isn't there, when you start putting things in the hands of the higher powers, I guess. And so there is an element of like, no, let's keep this underground. But then what it's not doing is reaching the most vulnerable um, that need it the most. And so that's where I feel like the government can play a role or philanthropy. So um, we haven't been very good to date in being able to speak or walk the talk to investors, philanthropists and, and governments. So we're starting to learn to do that. Um, and I do feel like there is a role um, for that, um, for those systems and that knowledge to come into play to help those, you know, um, marginalised communities especially. Um, and also, but not not do it in a way that's sort of top down. Really, to do it in a way where government gets out of the way, and their role is to really facilitate, um, you know, local communities doing it for themselves. And that's where technology can play a really positive role. So, um, come back to the the um, the idea of working with with uh, people who who need greater access to food, and and to bring mm. that to where you are, and as being a platform for being seen as well because you're in a hub and you have Mm. a lot of other enterprises that exist within the hub that you've created and one of those is also about the redistribution of food Mm. as well so it feels to me like the way that you're you're creating this sort of mutual network your visibility uh and and power to ripple out change in the food system is every day getting more and more because we're seeing that the success of it, that it, that it mm. works and that it, mm. it is not just about the farmer or it's not just about the consumer or it's not just about food aid. It is all of those things all together in a response to climate, in a response to, uh, you know, our current situation, in a response to, to drought, in a response to the decimation of small farms in Australia. I mean, it's a response to all those things simultaneously and many many more so um you know just maybe if you could speak a little bit about that the food hub and Mm. uh, and yeah so one of the things that um a lot of people probably um forget about the food system is that it's so complex um you know and but that's also the beauty of it as well i mean there's so so many roles for different people to play um, particularly in a positive response to COVID, um, the pandemic, as well as climate change in the food system. Um, we were talking to one of our farmers um, this week, actually. He does custard apples um, on the north coast of New South Wales, but he's also a CSIRO statistician. And he's written reports over the years that haven't really even seen the light of day, which basically confirmed that, you know, the CO2 emissions um that's attributed to the globalised food system um, is more likely 50% um, of global emissions than the sort of 30% that's often, um, you know, put out there in terms of the stats. So when you have a look at the the food system from seed right through to the person's plate and everything in between, particularly the transport and distribution, we we sort of Food Connect decided to focus on the distribution side of things because 
if you localize distribution and and supply, um, then you're building a lot more transparency and equity um, and relationships. Um, you know, it's a relationship based food system um, when it's a localized food system rather than just a transactional one. Um, when you're looking at long long supply chains um, in the globalized system, um, so. Recognising how complex the food system is, we wanted to invite people into the hub, the Food Connect hub. We call it the Food Connect Shed. Um, so we only take up, Food Connect only takes up a third of the space for our own operations. And so that, it, that allows other people to come in um, to experiment, do their own experiments, um, but also to run their own enterprises and not-for-profits out of the, um, by being co-located. And that way we can have mutual um, conversations and and I mean there's not a lot of time to do projects together because we're so focused on our own operations but just those um, incidental conversations that happen in the hallways on your way to the toilet or the staff kitchen or whatever um, so many ideas get thrown around and and um, and things happen um, out of those so um, so we've got Oz Harvest there who do food um, rescue um, and they also acknowledge that, you know, food rescue is just addressing the symptoms of the market failure of the larger food system. Um, and they're always looking at ways that they can introduce programs like food literacy and, um, you know, developing cooking skills and those sorts of things into their programs for marginalised communities, which is really exciting. Um, we've got a commercial kitchen that's set up, which is a community shared kitchen, and we rent it out by the half day to small food entrepreneurs who want to test out their products and sell them into the market. Um, and they, you know, we, we do have a, a policy that they try and source as locally as possible or their raw, raw products, um, in the processing of their food. And we also allowed some space for education and events. Um, so when the pandemic lifts, um, we'll be able to uh, start, you know, sharing um, uh, our event space again with the local community. Um, because what we've found is that um, we've we've spent 14 years shoving messages down people's throats about we really need to move to a local food system. And you can do that till the cows come home. But unless people have an experience um, that's positive, uh, then the pennies won't drop. So that's why, you know, over the years, we've taken a lot of our customers out to farms on farm tours to meet our farmers and have that experience of, of what it's like to be a farmer. And they get to, you know, look them in the eye and ask them all the questions. And it's then that we get the feedback from people saying, that's when the penny really dropped for me. Mm. Um, and then with the event space, similarly, we invite people in that could just be a wedding or a 40th or, um, you know, a film night. Um, and they, they're in this industrial space in the middle of nowhere in Brisbane and they, and they go, what's this space all about? Um, and that's when the curiosity leads to, well, this is about a local food system. Mm -hmm. And that, that invitation to find out more is a, um, is a journey for that person. Like it's an individual journey, um, to realize for themselves that there is another way of doing things that's, um, safe, nutritious, healthy. Um, and fun, you know. So yeah, which, it, you know, the how, forget the element of fun. Yeah, like the, <laughs> how how the message actually does reach people at different levels, and and at what point, and and that mm. you know, like through celebration and through fun and through opening up, but still being within that context of of the of a of a food system I think is really important it's and it yeah. kind of reminds me too about how we we learn best I'm just I'm very <laughs> mindful of at the moment you know the how our schooling is happening mm. and how different kind of learning is happening because we're in different contexts and and uh you know it happens for us as as adults too that's um, right but I wanted to to duck back to what you said about taking people out to farms. So you're talking oh. about the impact that that had on the consumers, but what are you seeing that that's having an impact on the farmers themselves? Yeah, so one of the things that we always thought um, was the most important thing about setting up a local food system was this um, farm gate price for farmers because we know that the industrialised food system often pays farmers below the cost of production. And there's this mantra of get big or get out, you know, um, that small farmers just can't cut it today in, in today's market. It's just not possible. Um, we wanted to prove that theory wrong 
by keeping everything lean in the middle as much as possible, we're able to return a farm gate price back to farmers that's four times the industrial average. Basically. Four times. So, yeah. So, um, so yeah, we have a business rule that we return forty to fifty cents in the retail dollar um, back to our farmers. So you're um, saying that it's typically only ten cents in a dollar that farmers get, yeah. or less sometimes even, or less depending on what they grow. Yeah. Yeah. So it's um so so that that triggers farmers to say, oh my God, well then it's all about volume. If I'm only going to get ten cents in the retail dollar for this, you know, lettuce or whatever, then I've got to grow five thousand more lettuces um in order to be competitive in this market. The quantity instead of quality. That's right. Yeah. And that's where you find people, you know, compromising on their growing methods. They start using chemicals, they start growing monocultures, they, you know, forget about biodiversity on their farms. So, um, so and that's where we run into the environmental problems that we, we're seeing in the food system. Mm -hmm. um, so, but that isn't the only driving factor. While money is important, <laughs> what we've found is that just being acknowledged mm -hmm. um, for doing a good job is just, is more rewarding than anything and having a whole bunch of people from the city who know nothing about how food's grown coming and saying thank you mm. um really does um it 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 switches a light on for them for the farmers and we've had so much you know amazing feedback um, from them over the years about how they would have given up hadn't they mm. had they known that they weren't feeding those people you know yeah. That so that valuing that. the person is not just the monetary value, but the, the yeah. personal value, because the messaging has always been, particularly with with even the monetary value, that it's really what you're doing is really not that worth that much. And you know, no. if you if you've got any wits about you, you'd be going to the city and getting a real job, kind of. Yeah, thing. which so, most of them are doing now. <laughs> and <laughs> so mass migration. So have you, have you got the figures on like what's the average age of farmers these days and, and uh, is that yeah. in the kind of farming that you're doing? You're seeing that there is a, a, new, a new farmer that's emerging or yeah, sort of we size are. of farms that you work with now too in and around? So the farms, um, we only have about one or two kind of what you would call sort of industrial scale organic farms on our books and they're sort of like our backup plan if, if um, our small farmers are having issues um, but most small most of our small farmers are on um, you know very small plots like it's it's not a lot of land um, and a lot of them are mixed so a lot of them are doing sort of vertical integration with animals as well as vegetables um, and keeping it nice and small and diverse so what um, you're really saying there is if people would you know, had a small farm or even a hobby farm or even some really intense kind of urban farm yeah, and, and did some kind of, you know, in a way a, a really diverse permaculture design on it, that they could then connect in with you and start to create a livelihood from their small farm. Is yeah. That so we've, we've got that at the moment. We have about, um, well, we have 80, 80 farmers roughly on our books, but in any, any um, given week we're probably directly... Um, talking to about 20 or 30 depending on the season um, and I would say about a third of those are now urban farmers wow. so it was a few years ago now where we we um, an honours student came to us from UQ saying I want to do a project with you guys what can I do and we said we want you to write the Brisbane food plan <laughs> we don't have time to do it we've got all the ideas but we don't have time to write it so he did that and he looked at Brisbane, okay, where should you get your food from, Brisbane? Um, and he looked at it through the, you know, the zones in permaculture. So looking at the house, looking at, you know, um, Brisbane as the as zone zero um, and where we should get, um, you know, our fresh greens from and herbs should really come from our own backyard. So we had a 10-year plan that, you know, by the end of the 10 years, we would be, in, most of our customers would be growing their own fresh lettuces and herbs. They wouldn't need to go to Food Connect to buy them. Um, and then zone one is sort of like the, the sort of harder things to grow, harder vegetables and, and fruits to grow and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, the grains and, and the meat and whatever um, are further out. Um, and so it's not true to the permaculture zoning, but it's, a, it's more of a guide to think, to get people to think about appropriate scale and and uses for for um, 
for the city context. Um, but we also used some other other lenses through which we viewed food in Brisbane. So we looked through at a social justice lens. We looked at the environmental impact. We looked at um, the economic lens, like who gets paid for doing what. Um, how do we keep the money circulating locally? Because um, over the years, we've um, some of the research that we've done, or the reading that we've done, shows that if you can keep money circulating locally, you're actually creating a four, three to four times multiplier effect compared to when you're just putting your money into a supermarket and, and off into some invisible shareholders. Um, so you're actually doing more for your local economy and your local community by keeping your dollars local. Um, and we also looked at the food system, Brisbane Food Plan, from a health um through a preventative health lens um, and we got some students from Griffith Uni, nutrition students, to analyse the average Food Connect customer and their intake of fruit and veg compared to, you know, conventional Australian citizens and what they normally do, the average diet. Um, and they found that, you know, just from a preventative health point of view that Food Connect customers consume 75% more fruit and veg than your average Australian. Wow, that's significant. Yeah, it has a huge impact on the health system, yeah. um, especially when it's, you know, grown on organic um, farms with no chemicals, mm. you know, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I mean, mm. it's, just, it's, it's phenomenal really, you know, it, and you can't, you can't measure the benefit economically <laughs> of this really, can you, because it no. is so, it's so it's in the system. In, yeah. In everything, that's right. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and so I think, you know, it's, and every piece in it, more ag, is interdependent on the other. Yeah. For it to, to for it to all be healthy and functioning, you've got to address every complex piece in the system all the time, mm. and that can be really hard. <laughs> 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 and so that's why we've always been open because we wanted to share everything we can and everything that we know, um, so that people can go, oh, I can I identify with that piece in the food system. I'm going to take that bit and run with it and create positive change through my talents or passion and I guess too that you know taking an entrepreneurial type of approach to it like you were saying and building in that adaptability and the flexibility and like constantly being able to kind of shift and change and move yeah. as, as you go but having it being a like a as a as a social entrepreneur how do you say that a social, yeah yeah that social entrepreneur <laughs> Yeah, I was That's trying what to we use call. it as an adjective for the business, but it wasn't. Kind yeah, of it's a generic. Yeah, it's a generic term that's used a lot these days. Um, so what do you basically how do you define it? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it basically um, anybody who's putting planet and people before profit, or even on an equal basis to profit. <laughs> Let's just start there. <laughs> it basically t it turns the mindset from an extractive mindset to a regenerative mindset. And so most social entrepreneurs out there are doing business for good. That's basically the, the short kind of version of it. But essentially they're, they're, they're wanting to use their entrepreneurial skills in a way that actually benefits other people and, and the environment um, and, you know, also provides them with a living. Yeah. Um, and so it's basically just how business should be in my opinion like every business should be an ethical business you should have a social and environmental license to operate no matter what you do mm -hmm. um and, es and essentially that's what social enterprise is all about yeah and um uh, and your your work that you're doing with the um the queensland social entrepreneur is it entrepreneurship um queensland social enterprise council enterprise okay Sorry. yeah yeah okay i've got to get my language right around this um, <laughs> So, so you're, uh, what are you currently doing with that at the moment? Is it um, more gathering the information or are you doing education through that? And, and so yeah. one of the main, main things, purposes of QSEC is um, to, uh, it's always been run by members. So it basically started because um, a small group of social entrepreneurs in Brisbane decided that, um, that they didn't have a voice. Um, that there are a lot of people in the social impact and innovation space, particularly with intermedi intermediaries, um, financing social impact and um, governments and the like, 
um, who were speaking on behalf of us but weren't really telling the true story. So a bunch of entrepreneurs got together and said, let's form our own sort of peak body, so to speak. It was sort of like an industry association, really. And so basically what we do is we get together whenever we can online these days um, and we advocate um, both to investors um, and uh, governments to um, create social, socially friendly policies in terms of um, business and um, legislation. So recently in Queensland, they've um, implemented a social um, uh, procurement policy, they call it. Um, so they're trying to educate buyers right across um, government because governments spend a lot of money with businesses. Um, in procuring services and goods. And so the idea is if they have a social procurement policy that um, when buyers go out seeking um, services or goods that they actually can tick the box that, that that supplier is a social enterprise or has some kind of impact, social or environmental impact by purchasing with them. And that can be a really powerful way to drive social change is, is, is by getting large institutions to spend their money more wisely yep. with the people who can provide services. Yep. Unfortunately, at the moment, because the whole, because the government buy is so huge, a lot of the buyers have been used to just going with one big multinational who can do all the things for them. Yep. Um, but what they're having to do is um, sort of <clears throat> redesign their contracts so that they can apportion some some of the money towards the the social enterprises that can fulfil those contracts. Mm. So that's one aspect of what we do. We also just are there for each other. So we've had a lot of webinars over the last, you know, month in particular, just trying to support each other through all the different programs that are out there in terms of help for businesses um, during the pandemic. But also um, recently we've um, we've set up a national alliance of um, member-run peak bodies like USEC. And it's been amazing. Um, we're, we're basically working on an, a position paper at the moment to present to the federal government um, so that we've got a, um, <clears throat> a voice in the post-COVID -recover, post recovery um, because what we need to be really careful of um, in the recovery phase after the pandemic is that business, is, as usual, is, is, doesn't take over again. Yeah. Um, and we're already seeing some rhetoric coming out of Canberra saying that, you know, um, particularly Angus Taylor saying that it's going to be a gas-led recovery. Um, and that's the last thing we need right now is, um, you know, more damage to the climate in a climate-induced pandemic. <laughs> that's right. And so, yeah. you know, these voices need to come out so strongly and we need to be ready. So it's yes. so fantastic to hear that, that you are talking in that way and, and you know, ready to speak up because it's absolutely what we need to be doing and and thinking yeah. about uh you know how 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 communities transition and that's kind of the other part of your work too mm. that with the next economy that you're working with communities um transitioning well it, you know you it started some time ago working transitioning from from the fossil fuel economy but you know the current situation on top of all of that, gives it even more reason yeah. to focus on a transition to to a different way. And so, what are the kinds of uh, what are the ways that you're working with communities to help them to transition? And and uh, what kind of things are you working working with them and talking about? And what kind of transition uh, is coming out of those conversations? Yeah, it's been really interesting. I've I've only recently joined Amanda Carl at the Next Economy, um, and she's obviously well known for her amazing work um, in regional communities um, and talking about economic transition. I mean, the initial conversation is around energy. So um, most of our work has been in coal um, communities around Queensland, and um, talking to those communities about what kind of future they want to see um, and what sort of you know. Um, sectors need to be supported, um, you know, in addition to renewable energy and other projects. Um, so there's so many, um, uh, you know, opportunities that are just lying under the surface for a lot of communities. But because they've been dominated by one particular industry, it's often at the expense of everything else. Um, and so you'll often see coal communities, um, you know, vehemently hold on um, to the coal because they know that all the industries that have popped up to support 
that major industry will also fall over um, if you take that away. So how can we build more resilience into lo our local regional economies um, by supporting as many diverse um, sectors as possible? Um, and there's so many um, innovative um, ideas that have come out of our conversations. We've got regenerative farmers really starting to step up um, talking about new food systems. Um, we've got a lot of people talking about, you know, incredible opportunities um, around waste and recycling and upcycling. And um, there's also incredible talk and action around um, small manufacturing. So um, if the global system suddenly comes to a halt and China locks down and we can no longer import stuff, um, what can we do to produce our own stuff locally? What small industries can we can we get going to start bringing in more skills and and more money into the local regional economy? So um, it's only just a a, a beginning, um, but we've seen some incredibly positive um, conversations come out of those regions recently. And the beauty of it is that. The community are coming up with these ideas themselves. They're being asked the question. You know, someone stopped and decided to take the time to ask the questions. Um, and there's so much wisdom in there, you know. And um, we don't need a big top-down approach. We just need the people in government, in big government, to say, okay, guys, where do you need the support? Mm -hmm. And let's work together to do that. And I was just going to say too that, you know, I think because of, because of what's happening now, because we're seeing the cracks in the system and how vulnerable it is that mm. these conversations somehow seem to be a lot more acceptable yes. now than they, they have been. Because, you know, these conversations are not new, are they? I mean, let's face it, these are things no. that we've been talking about for a long time. And, a long time, you yes. know, a lot of us have just been trying to keep it going. And all of a sudden yeah. there's, a, there's, a, there's a new awareness globally yeah. about the importance of these types of conversations happening in communities. So, so that's something that's happening in um, regional communities with the next economy. What are some of the things just from your experience of doing all the things that you do that people who are sitting maybe down the street from you and, in, in you know, in an urban environment, what are some of the ways that you think they can really support this movement of regeneration and resilience and, helping to support the, the recovery after COVID to not just go back to business as usual, but to be something else and, and to support that? Yeah, it's a good question. I often wonder myself, um, but I think they already know and they already have the answers themselves because they've been forced into isolation. Um, you know, we've all realised that, um, you know, there's, there was a bit of rhetoric at the start that, you know, this all of, we're all in this together, we're all in the same boat. And I read something recently where they said, well, we're not all in the same boat. We're all in the same ocean. We're all in the same pandemic ocean. But some of us are in little boats just try, trying to stay afloat, you know, with a leak, with a hole in the boat and with buckets, you know, trying to, you know, get the water out and just survive and get to land. Um, other of, others are in big cruise ships and they're just, they're fine um, and they're enjoying the downturn. Um, so it, if anything, the pandemic has really acutely highlighted the inequities in our system. So I think in terms of um, knowing that it's not everyone's equal in this, some people are loving the home time, loving spending time with their kids and whatever and cooking from scratch and enjoying all those things. Other people are just trying to figure out where they're going to get their next meal from. Um, particularly I feel for people in the inner city who are in these one-bedroom apartment blocks, you know, how are they coping? It must be so isolating for them. Um, so I guess um, one of the things, um, well, a few things that I would sort of do I guess would be um, well that I've noticed people doing actually um, is uh, particularly in our suburb we've had people out on their driveways every Sunday afternoon having dinner um, so that's been kind of cute there's been a few um, you know new stories on the news about that um, <clears throat> I think there's just this concept of mutual aid mm -hmm. is that um, you know if we can find ways to support um, the elderly like I think the 
the the elderly are very vulnerable in this particular, not just physically healthy health wise, but also emotionally um, vulnerable. And I think um, you know the idea of the care army that came out from the state government was a good idea. I'm not sure how it's worked in on the ground, but um, but communities are already doing that themselves in many ways too. Is just to look out for each for each other, even if all you're doing is looking out for either side mm-hmm. of your neighbour. Um, sharing tips like you do at five o'clock every afternoon on Facebook or YouTube, you know, like how to grow stuff, how to cook with things, um, how to use the whole pumpkin, um, including the vines and the leaves and everything, um, you know, finding finding ways to be more resilient in your day-to-day existence is, is really empowering. It's not just good to know and it's not just fun. It actually gives you agency. It gives you power. Um, and one of the things that I've found in my years at Food Connect is um, we've been able to develop skills, homesteading skills we call them, but what it actually does is it reduces your reliance on the nine to five Monday to Friday income to support yourself because you're able to subsidise your income by being self-sufficient in a lot of, in a lot of ways. And then that um, releases time and space in your life to do other things. To like- pursue things that really matter to you yes. yeah like i mean the caring the caring economy yeah. comes into into play doesn't it yeah. and, and we know that that's never that's never been attributed a dollar value mm-hmm. um but i always say to rob you know what would happen if if um if all the women mostly women who are the carers in households around the world what would happen if we all just went on strike one day <laughs> you know the awesome economy would work. stop <laughs> and, yeah i mean the economy would, would, would stop what if we all started to work from home a lot more and what if our work week was three days a week and what, yeah. what, what if there was the, you know, the universal basic income? You know, there's all these different questions yeah. that are kind of coming up that are, there are and, yeah. you know, and, and eating differently and, like you're saying, a different type of sense of community. Like the, the ripple effect of that too, that once you start to feel a greater sense of connectedness, to your community and therefore to your place, mm. then you start to behave differently, don't you, in your you community do. and place. And the, the caring then extends beyond into, into your natural environment, into your water system, to your bioregion and to the, to the farmers that are in your bioregion or to the Indigenous communities that are, you know, part of, you know, the, the, that have been there forever, you know. Yes. And so, our relationships change and once one set of relationships has a kind of a, 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 a reorientation, everything yeah. starts to, to ripple out from there. And so it's this, we, are in, we are in a process right now of quite, um, quite profound systems change. Mm. And while there's massive suffering, there is also the, every, you know, everything's up in the air, it feels, and we have a chance to kind of catch things differently as they start to to fall and settle back into place and and have and have you know like that word you were saying before the agency we have the agency to to be influences in that mm. from from the community from our neighborhoods and to speak up and say actually you know what we were on this train of life before following what we thought was the right thing to do you know but now we've we've kind of all just been bumped off that and we've seen that there is actually a different way of doing things, a different way to live, a different way to have an economic system, a different way to feed ourselves, a different way to relate, a different way to educate our children. This, we've actually had an experience that we may not like all of that, with there may be bits that we like to choose, but as we kind of pack things back together again, uh, as we move out of this crisis, it's going to be different. And I, and I really encourage people to, to speak up of what it is that they value and find important and want to embrace as we move forward from from now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've um, we've as a society, I think we kind of lost sight, didn't we, of what really matters and what COVID has done is really remind us that you know at the end of the day, it's looking after each other. And whether you you have a family or whether you're living on your own and you exist in an apartment complex, that is a community. Mm-hmm. Um, and and how you relate to your neighbours is, is, is just as valuable as, you know, your expertise that you contribute after you've, you know, um, when you're in the, in the real economy, as they call it. 
Um, and I often think that women kind of get this stuff a little bit better at times because <clears throat> especially women, um, you know, who've experienced childbirth or, um, you know, been uh, in a caring role where they've had to sort of interrupt their, their own careers um, to step into a, a caring role um, for a close family member or, or family or um, child because, um, because you have that, we, we've often experienced that short circuit to our normal life and often what happens in that process is that you realise that you actually don't want to go back to that normal life again. You actually want to explore um, a little bit of both. What does a bit of both look like in a healthy, balanced way? Um, get off that hamster wheel and start, you know, bringing more meaning into your own life but also pursuing your, you know, your career goals at the same time. It's not about having it all. It's about having a little bit, you know, uh, yeah. of, of what you want. Yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah. And uh, just thinking too then about, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a redefinition of our relationship with ourselves and what we mm value in our own lives and in our families but it's also uh, you know bringing it back to to say food connect it's you know our community is also the members of our food system and yeah. so you know by having a close relationship with something like food connect then you don't feel isolated in your in your apartment because you are interconnected that's right. Yeah, yeah, you've got to get out of your apartment and go and grab your box from your local city cousin. Yeah, and you might and just happen expanded. to bump into people on the way. Yeah, that's right. Your world has expanded. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's that sense of belonging, and um, you know, I don't know if you get that with Coles and Woolies. Um, <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> Even though they have loyalty programs. Yeah, I was just gonna say there's a sense of brand loyalty, but it's different. It's absolutely <laughs> different, isn't it? You yeah, know? it is. It when is. When it comes to to actually feeling cared for and nurtured and connected yeah. and and you know, this relation the relationships. And I think we mm -hmm. are finding that the richness of our relationships is is flourishing mm -hmm. right now in many in many ways. So, mm -hmm. so it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me this morning. And, oh, you're um, welcome, Maura. It's been great. We kind of went all so many. We did. We went everywhere <laughs> from from global to local. But that's kind of yeah. this inner point when we're exploring systems change. That, you know, the micro is the macro. Is the macro, all yeah, one and the same thing. So, thank you so much, and um, you're welcome. Look forward to talking with you again soon. Thanks, Morag. Yeah. Lovely to spend time with you. You too. <laughs> so thanks for tuning in to the Sense Making in a Changing World podcast today. It's been a real pleasure to have your company. I invite you to subscribe and receive notification of each new weekly episode with more wonderful stories, ideas, inspiration and common sense for living and working regeneratively and call positive permaculture thinking and design into action in this changing world. I'm including a transcript below and a link also to my four-part permaculture series, really looking at what is permaculture and how to make it your livelihood too. So join me again in the next episode where we talk with another fascinating guest. I look forward to seeing you there.